Hey guys. Bottom 25 here. Watching the launch of um, Ariana Spass VS23. Also to our friends in Toulouse at the Cité de l'Espace for following us as well. Hi also to all of our partners here and in Europe and around the world. There we go, first umbilical has retracted. And there's the mast. We're ready to go. We're going to cut away. You'll hear the DDO call out the final countdown. Enjoy the launch. Second gantry is retracted. Ignition of the Soyuz. There. Oh, there's a new camera in one picture. There we go, lifts off. Weirdly, the actual Ariane Spouse broadcast isn't working, so I'm going to use third party. Yeah, this is an exoplanet probe, basically. Or exoplanet, not exoplanet probe, it's like... Just exoplanet telescope, I guess. It's some, I presume it's something sort of like Kepler. Oh. Meant to go up yesterday. Yes, CSG1 and CHEOPS. He ups, I don't know. I'm not gonna try. There. Got another view of the vehicle. So it just comes in and out of the clouds. Stabilization du lanceur sur les trois axes. Well, fine shots. Always impressive no matter how many times you see Soyuz powering into the sky. Three hundred and nine tons of liftoff. That's less than half the mass of Ariane five. The boosters are the first stage. The boosters on the central core, or second stage, are burning now. As, you as the DDO says, all is well on board. The boosters weigh 45 tons each at liftoff. I wonder if we get to see Coral of Cross. Just probably not because that. Well, who knows? Running on liquid hydrogen, sorry, liquid oxygen, and kerosene. Kerosene. Same propellants used in each of the three lower stages. And I presume the Fregat is hypergolics. The second, or the core stage, similar to the boosters, its ignition occurred on the launch pad. As you saw, the stage will burn for four minutes. Remember, Soyuz weighed 309 tons. Oh, separation of the boosters there. After separation of her boosters, which you may be able to see. That's what it would look like. That's, a, that's the core left cross there. Separation at separation of her boosters, she's down to 135 tons. So in less than two minutes, she loses more than half her weight. On the bottom of your screen, on the left, our altitude. On the right, our speed. These figures coming in Les from the downrange stations. Galio in yellow. Oh my god, how long is this mission? I'm confused. It scares me. It's the local station here in Kourou. The uh, data are received by the Russian in the launch center then confirmed before being broadcast. Next up is jettison, jettison of the fairing. It's in about 20 seconds. Fairing measures of 4 meters in diameter stands at 11 meters tall. We can get rid of it. This is a pretty steady altitude versus downrange thing. Like it's got a, almost a straight line. Because this of the dense layers of the atmosphere, there's no more friction, no more heating, which can disturb, uh, anything to disturb the satellites. There we go. You see the fairing jettison. There's another half, which is out of camera range on the port side of the vehicle. This powered phase of Soya's first three stages will last about nine minutes. Then the upper composite, called the Fregate, that's the upper stage, with the satellites will be separated takes over and does the rest of the work, completing the mission. Europe's space effort is a three-way affair. Ariane Space marketing and operating the launch services and the Ariane program. The European Space Agency funding 
Cassini programs and the French Space Agency CNES overseeing coordination of all space-based operations. Marianne Claire, you heard her here just at the beginning of the broadcast, new director of the space base since uh, a month, roughly, and also the first woman to hold the role. Confirmation de la séparation des deux demi -coffs. Site here, chosen that took in 1964 because of many advantages. Longer. Now I presume that could just be because it goes via Moscow. Now I'm a bit curious why the satellite's offset. Because like it doesn't look like it's center, central on the forget. Okay, yep, hot staging, they ignite the third stage before they separate the second stage because. And then you've got those skirt things separating shortly. There you go. Allumage block E. Third stage. The DDI has just called that out. An unusual aspect of the Soyuz, whereas with Ariane, for example, we separate the lower stage before igniting the upper stage. Soyuz does the opposite. The third stage. Because they weren't sure that they would be able to ignite the thing in the an engine in ZOG when they designed it originally. And they still pull it. Makes it simpler, less like it doesn't need to be pressure fed or anything. Down toward the stage below where it rebounds, giving an added thrust, assisting separation. The third stage skirt is then separated ten seconds later, and during those ten seconds, Soyuz climbs four kilometers. Pretty impressive. In the version of Soyuz without the frigate upper stage, it's the third stage. Older version. It's a Soyuz. It's the same version, just without a fregat. Second generation. Hi, I'm Veronique Loisel, and I am the program director for Cosmos SkyMet Second Generation at Ariane Space. My work mainly consists in interfacing with our customer for all subjects linked to technical matters, but also contractual communication, financial, insurance, and legal aspects. Our job is to respond at best at our customers' requests. As for Cosmos SkyMet second generation, the 2,205 kilogram main satellite was manufactured by Thales Alenia Space in Italy for the benefit of the Italian Space Agency and the Italian Ministry of Defense. It is a drug system, civil and military, designed to address the requirements of both commercial and government customers, as well as the scientific community. Cosmos SkyMet second generation will be part of a constellation of two satellites, which aims at providing an enhanced quality of the imaging services to the end customers with respect to the current CSK constellation. LS Alinea Space is a very important customer and partner for Ariane Space. Indeed, Cosmos SkyMet second generation represents the 167 satellite manufactured by the company and to be launched by Ariane Space. It will be also the fourth satellite to be launched for the Italian Space Agency and the ninth for Italy, comprising ASI, Italian MOD and Telespazio. You may have noticed that since the start of the mission, events are announced by the DDA with maybe a slight one, two second delay. Well, it's more than one, two second delay, Nash. This is quite normal, nothing to be alarmed about. The information that's telemetry and radar coming into the ground stations and sent by them here to Jupiter have to be first confirmed by our Russian teams in Moscow. Then they come to French Guiana at the CVI, which is the Quick Look Telemetry Center, which relays them to the DDA here. So at certain moments, there going up to the CBI for a visit later in the broadcast. The Soyuz we're using today, it's the most recent version of Soyuz 2. Originally, you might recall, Soyuz was a missile called the R-7, the Senorca. world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, developed in 1953 by Sergei Korolev, the father of the Soviet space program. The Soviet R-7 hey, was model the of the German V-2. Okay, so we've got third stage cut off and separation. There's the separation of the third stage. There you can see it falling away. 
looks like. And with that, we have come to the end of the first part of the powered flight phase. We're now awaiting confirmation. I don't know. First oh, no, never mind. It's fine. At the top of your screen, that's We're waiting for confirmation of the first frigate burn. There will be seven of them. Some although all are headed toward a sun synchronous oh, orbit, Jesus, it's just left its own orbit, of course, and its own mission, multiple mission tonight. Cosmos SkyMed Earth Observation. This is how to gradually work its way back up. I don't want to shock it. to be 1080p. Going to get 470 right. kilometers up roughly. Our speed, speed 6.2 kilometers. Bon this first burn will last 11 minutes. The second burn will take place at plus one hour into the mission and the third 51 minutes later. That's the frigate upper mission. stage produced by NPO Lavochkin, prime contractors. Mass at liftoff 6.3 tons carries almost as much in fuel, 5.3 tons. Frigate stands a meter and a half tall. Frigate is an autonomous, flexible upper stage, relatively recent addition, qualified in 2000. It has been designed to operate as an orbiter and thus extends the capability of the Soyuz, giving her access to all orbits, low Earth orbit, sun synchronous like tonight. Medium Earth Orbit, GTO, GEO, and Escape. It's independent from the lower three stages, since it has its own tracking telemetry systems, navigation, and guidance. Our second film on Cosmos, SkyMos, SkyMed, sorry, up next. So I am actually still debating with the Oaks to plan for that whole thing. The Cosmos SkyMed system consists of a constellation of four identical satellites equipped with a high-resolution SAR, synthetic aperture radar, operating in X-band. It is a, a dual civil and defense uh, system designed to address the requirement of both commercial and government customers, as well as the scientific community. Cosmos SkyMed allows global coverage of the planet, operating in all weather condition and lightning, and provides the geolocalized images with extreme accuracy. The Cosmos Climate System is a flagship of Italian technology in the world. It is the only constellation of this type currently existing in the global level. It is founded by the Italian Space Agency and the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Education, University and Research. The first and second generation of Cosmos System is a result and expression of the best skill of the Italian space industry. The second generation of the Cosmos system will ensure the continuity in the services so far provided by the first generation satellites and ground segments, representing a real generational leap in terms of technology, performance and operational life of the system and providing new application possibility. Both satellites of the second generation are improved version of the original design the Cosmos second generation SAR is also an improved version of the first generation X-band SAR system. Talesa Legna Space in Italy is the program by contractor, therefore responsible for the development and construction for the entire Cosmos SkyMed system. Telespazio built the entire ground segment of this constellation, whilst Leonardo Electronics Division participate in the program producing state-of-the-art equipment that regulates and distributes the satellite electrical power. Thanks to the progressive growth of design and technological skills in SAR, Thales Alenia Space uh, came into the 90s with the development of the constellation Cosmos Cayman. The satellite platform that was used in a variety of missions such as Radarsat 2 and also in the ESA Copernicus Sentinel-1 radar satellite. Cosmo gave us also important commercial opportunity we in fact have signed an important contract with Korean Agency for Defense and Development. I hope we hope to continue on this successful path with other commercial achievements in the future. Finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the Italian Ministry of Defense and the Italian Space Agency for continuing to trust in us as a partner. 
and also let me congratulate with all Talesa Lenya Space team, you know, all the employees that worked uh, timelessly to reach these great results in terms of milestone. During the film, we were picked up by our next downrange traffic station Saint -Hubert. at Saint Hubert in Quebec. So he is heading north. We're no longer being followed by the Galio station here locally in French Guiana. We're out of range. Saint Hubert, located outside Montreal, the Canadian Space Agency has its mobile servicing system operations complex there, all kinds of training and tracking facilities for space operations and support. SkyMed team. Their satellite will be separated in about 8 minutes plus 12 minutes, I should say, plus 22 minutes 44 seconds. Cosmo SkyMed is the fourth satellite to be launched by Air and Space for the Italian Space Agency, ASI. The three others, two were launched on Vegas, that was Prisma and Laris, Laris on the very first uh, Vega mission, and Athena Fidus. Our next film on the first passenger will give you an idea what the satellite will do once it's in place. Now we're approaching the first cutoff of the fregat.
nice illustration during the film of the satellite uses its spot beams. All proceeding normally on board at 19 minutes into the mission, 16 minutes to go in this first part. A note on the launch pad from where we lifted off. What do you mean 16 to go on this first part? Roughly, it's the seventh in the world, seventh Soyuz pad, and the most recent until about three years ago. What's Doshny? There are two Soyuz pads at Baikonur, four at Lasetsk. A new pad, the world's eighth, was built in Russia at Vostochny with a gantry, and the gantry is only used here at the CSG and at the new site at Vostochny. Because all the other places are dry and... Up in about 30 seconds on extinction of the first frigate burn, and you'll hear the DDO. Uh, so some other Soyuz facts. Besides orbiting the first artificial satellite Sputnik, yeah, variant. Years ago, yeah, the variant. The first space. Gagarin, yes. Same thing with any space. Russian manned flight, really. Soyuz also holds the world's highest demonstrated reliability record, close to 99%. That's pretty normal. Okay, extinction of the Fregat. First stage engine shutting down. So that burn is over. So he is positioning himself for release of the first satellite, CSG-1. The frigate is on the extreme left of the vehicle. Our next film on Cosmos SkyMed first maneuvers after separation. Giancarlo, you are the Cosmos SkyMed second generation program director at the Italian Space Agency. Could you explain us the mission in a few words? Cosmos Canada Second Generation is an Italian national air observation program. It's based on a constellation of X-band synthetic aperture radar satellites. It's a joint initiative between the Italian Space Agency and the Italian Ministry of Defense and enables through a single system to fulfill both military and civilian national air observation needs. With the second generation, Italy will continue to benefit of a key space infrastructure that allows observing our planet in night and day and all weather conditions, providing also additional capabilities to the first generation, still in operation since more than 10 years. Thanks, Giancarlo. Andrea, you are the satellite mission director. How would you summarize the different steps which will happen after the separation? Concerning the commissioning of the satellite, we will follow a nominal process. During the LEOP, the satellite will deploy the solar array wings, the expand downlink antennas, and the phased array antenna of the sub payload. Before Christmas, we will enter in the in-orbit test phase. The satellite will reach its final orbit at down dust from synchronous orbit with an average altitude of 620 kilometers, and we will perform the calibration of the electronic beams of the sub payload. In springtime, we will complete the endeavor with the operational teams to allow the satellite to start to provide the services to our end users. Approaching the separation of Cosmos SkyMed. Cosmos SkyMed, you can see on the left of the vehicle. The ninth satellite to be launched by Arian Space for Italy. Two more Italian satellites to be launched in the Arian Space backlog. There will be a CSG-2. There's also an auxiliary payload. CSG-1 built by Talos Alenia Space, the 161st satellite launched by Arian Space, there it goes. manufactured by the group. And there you have the scheduled separation. We're waiting for the DDO confirmation. Again, we mentioned the slight lapse. Before we get confirmation, always a moment of high concentration in Jupiter and around the world as it all the posts, the team satellite. Separation course marking an end as well as a beginning, but some of the uh, Cosmo SkyMed team has been on the project <coughs> for years, for others, will be just beginning. Confirmation de la separation de la charge du type Cosmos SkyMed second generation. Right, and you see the DDO confirming. And you hear the applause. Don't they usually... The news of the night? 
Don't they usually reserve the applause to all satellites are deployed? For the Cosmo people, you can see their smiles, a moment of triumph, watching their satellite leaving the mothership on its way to begin life on orbit. The satellite's early orbit maneuvers will take one week. In-orbit testing will be completed by next March. Start of operation is scheduled for June. There will be a second Cosmos Sky Moon mentioned to be launched next year, I believe, and Ozzy tells us that full operational capacity with the two satellite fleet will be available in mid-2021. And on that note, we're going to go to a launch replay, and you can relive those very exciting moments as soon as left the pad almost half an hour ago. Frigate is moving into her first ballistics phase. We will suspend the broadcast momentarily while she does so and give you a break. We'll be back for more of the mission. Remember, four more passengers to be launched. You can stay connected during the break via the internet or watch events on the screen. Here in Kuru, the VIPs and visitors watching from the other observation sites at the base will be joining the crowd here for a breakfast. Everyone will return to their sites, to this site, to their sites for the second part of the broadcast, which will begin at plus two hours and one minute. So enjoy the break. We'll see you back here then. Yep, I'll probably come back if I remember to uh, see you then if I do, and I'll consider this the end of the video if I don't. Martin 25, see you then. For you in just about uh, ten seconds, you'll be able to read okay, guys, this is the second bit the, uh, shots of, of the broadcast, so. We had successful yeah. liftoff of the Soyuz on time at 5.54 and 20 seconds local, the ninth and final Ariane space flight of the year, and the third Soyuz of 2019 roared off the pad majestically, rising into the skies above French Guiana, lost in the clouds, in the low clouds uh, momentarily, but reappearing once she gained some altitude. Following that, everything worked flawlessly. The boosters were released on time after having done their job. Then came the fairing, separated 106 kilometers up. The second stage completed its burn and got separated, followed by the third stage, released at plus 8 minutes and 49 seconds. Then the upper stage, the frigate took over, igniting its engine for the first of seven burns to position itself. Canadian ground station uh, picked up the station. Cosmos SkyMed separated at plus 22.44. The Australia station acquired the signal, and the second frigate burn took place before the Gallio station, Canada, acquired the signal again as Soyuz completed her first orbit of the Earth. The adapter covering the next passenger, Kiops, was released. The Quebec station acquired the signal again. The frigate burned her engine a third time, and finally, we were picked up by the Lucknow station in India. So that is where we are first part of the mission was a letter perfect. Terry. We just should. Yes, Josh. The second part of the mission is now going to be totally devoted to the second passenger, in other words, the Cheops mission, which is the exoplanet mission. And the name of your guest? The second passenger is from the uh, European Space Agency. And when we return to the booth, or we're in the booth when we return to uh, after the film, I'll be joined by a special guest. Kate Isaac, who's the space uh, scientist, you can see here alongside of me, space scientist for the mission, will be able to tell you all about the mission until the satellite separation. So, a lot coming up. Don't go away. So, on the French side, uh, I will be with uh, Billy Benz. But let's take a look at uh, Kiops together with uh, Fabrizio Fabiani. Hello, I'm the Arian Space Program Director for Kiops. After the separation of the first satellite, we are now waiting for the next step of the mission, that is the separation of the second passenger, Kiops, and it will be delivered at an altitude of 700 kilometers in a down dusk sun synchronous orbit to observe bright stars already known to host exoplanets. This orbit has been selected to ensure stable thermal conditions and minimize the effects of the Earth's ray light on the scientific measurements. Keops, the characterizing 
Exoplanet Satellite is ESA's first mission dedicated to the study of extrasolar planets. Cheops will observe bright stars that are already known to host planets, measuring small brightness changes due to the planet's transit across the star's disk. Cheops measurements will allow to characterize planets with a size similar to Earth, deriving accurately their radius and allowing to calculate their density. The prime contractor for the design and construction of the spacecraft is Airbus Spain. The payload, based on an optical telescope with an effective aperture of 30 cm, was developed by a consortium of ESA member states under the lead of the University of Bern. KEOPS is the first fast-track mission in the ESA science program and is expected to operate for three years and a half, providing state-of-art measurements to the scientific community. I will come back to you later on for describing the mission of the other three passengers of this VS-23 mission. We want to welcome Kate Isaac from ESA, the European Space Agency. You are project scientist from Kiev. I get that right? Indeed. All right. For how long have you been project I've been working at ESA as a project scientist for the six years. All right. So as project scientist, tell us about, about a little bit about your role in the project. I make one of the links between science and uh, engineering. And to do this, I work very closely with the PI of the mission, Billy Bentz, who's in the booth uh, next to me, and also the uh, project manager, Nicola Rando, at uh, ESA. And what we try and do is to make sure we get the best science, taking into account the practical constraints, engineering constraints, budget, and of course, time. And this means working in closely with scientists and engineer from engineers from the consortium and all over ESA. Tell us just briefly, 15 seconds, about the consortium, because that's an important part. Indeed. The consortium is, a, a, is made up of 11 countries that are member states uh, of ESA. It's led by Willy Bentz from the University of Bern, and the consortium makes up a partnership uh, between Switzerland and uh, ESA. And they can contribute to the hardware, the software, and the science of the mission. All right. Up next, the first in a series of films on Kiops. Back with more with Kate afterwards. This is Chaos, a specialist satellite with a single instrument, a powerful camera or photometer. It'll record the light from stars orbited by known exoplanets. Chaos is designed to investigate what these planets are like. We'll be focusing on smaller planets, so Earth-sized to Neptune-sized planets, which have been found by other missions, such as Kepler, to be very abundant around other, uh, other stars, sun-like stars, something which is not so much the case in our own solar system. So it's a big question. What are these uh, uh, smaller planets? What are they made of? Chaops will do this by measuring the variation in light caused when an exoplanet passes in front of its host star. Chaops is about taking the next uh, step uh, in investigating planets beyond uh, our solar system and in particular aims at uh, providing a reliable and accurate measurement of the size of the planets and from there uh, be able to derive uh, their density and therefore their composition. The Space Telescope will orbit some 700 kilometers above the Earth, with its camera always pointing towards the night side. This will limit the effects of any stray light disturbing its measurements. Chaos is a relatively low-cost and low-risk mission, since all its elements have already been proven in flight. Nevertheless, building a satellite to obtain precise measurements of light from alien stars has been a complex technical challenge. The instrument was designed to be able to perform accurately over long periods of time and the satellite was designed around the instrument to guarantee these stable conditions. As you can see, uh, the satellite has uh, a sun shield protecting the instrument from the direct sun illumination. And this uh, is uh, very important to allow the proper thermal stabilization of the detector inside the instrument. So far, more than 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered by telescopes on Earth and in space, with the number rising almost every week. Chaos will give us an insight into the nature of these planets, and even whether some of them have the potential for life. 
In doing so, this small satellite will help us take the next step in answering a fundamental question about the universe. Are we alone? Let's talk a little more about the satellite now. Maybe we should start with exoplanets. Uh, they are planets outside our solar system. Why do they need a dedicated ESA mission? Yeah, firstly, indeed, a planet, an exoplanet, is a planet orbiting a star other than our own. The first star, was, the first exoplanet was found back in 1995. It's a Jupiter-sized pla uh, planet orbiting quite close to its host star. Since then, it was from the ground, it was from a telescope uh, uh, on ground. And since then, many have been found also from the ground. But what we're really interested in is the smaller planets, Earth to Neptune-sized planets, trying to find out what they're, what they're made of. And stars this, uh, planets this uh, small uh, are difficult to, to detect from the ground. We, we talked about the transit technique earlier, and uh, uh, a Jupiter-sized uh, planet transiting a uh, uh, star the size of the sun would block about 1% of the light. When you say transit, I'm just very quick, it's going across, it's like you'd see an eclipse. Indeed, it's the same, it's the same phenomenon. But an Earth-sized uh, planet would block 100th of that, so 0.01%. And that we simply cannot do from the ground. For that, we have to have a, a space mission. So we have to fly half telescopes, half uh, missions, I guess. Is the the different, different, uh, different techniques are used to find planets, and these have different selection effects. We find different uh, size planets orbiting different types of stars. OK. Our next film on how Geops will look for exoplanets. Thanks to space telescopes like the International Hubble Mission, we know there are some two trillion galaxies in the observable universe and hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy alone. Now technology is revealing planets orbiting many of these stars and we're beginning to understand what they're like. In 1995, Michel Mayor and Didier Kellos from the Geneva Observatory co-discovered the first ever exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star. But this year, they won the Nobel Prize in Physics for their work. In Good for days, them. I was using a technique that we call radial velocity, which is um, observing a star and looking for any change of speed in the star. Well, since Dr. then, Schick. the field has just exploded. As, as you may know, there is really now thousands of exoplanets. Um, there are a lot of planets known uh, to be transiting, which means the planet goes right in front of the star. And, um, and that's these techniques that we're using for, for the Curves mission. Thanks to ground-based observations and planet hunting missions such as Coro and Kepler, more than 4,000 exoplanets have now been discovered. They range from small rocky planets to gas giants larger than Jupiter. Chaops will be targeting known planets between the size of Earth and the icy giant Neptune, which has four times our planet's radius. The mission will probe the nature of these exoplanets and begin to answer questions such as whether any of these alien worlds could support life. Keops's uh, aim is to measure the size of already known exoplanets. So it's not a discovery mission. It's really aimed at precisely measure the size. And once we have the size and possibly the mass, we can derive the mean density. And from then we know a little bit what the planet is made of. Data from the Orbiting Space Telescope will be processed in banks of computers at the Geneva Observatory, home to the Chaos Science Operations Center, where scientists will also decide which exoplanets to target. We're sending the observation program to the Mission Operations Center in, in uh, Madrid, uh, where then the information is uplinked to the actual instrument. The instrument is configured to observe the, the star, and then the telemetry, the data is downlinked uh, to the Mission Operations Center and right away forwarded to us here in Geneva, where we then can do the data processing, uh, archive the data, and then provide it to the scientists uh, all over Europe and to the world. By making repeated observations of several hundred planets, Chaops will provide an important insight into the inner structure of exoplanets, how they form and evolve, and whether any are even a little bit like the Earth. The first film talked about 4,000 exoplanets, I think, that have already been found. 
I can think of uh, a couple of many, many missions. There's a Kness mission, Coro, a couple of years back, a couple of NASA flights, Kepler and TESS. What will Kiops do that all these missions and all the other telescopes discovered from the ground, as you mentioned, have not been able to do? I guess the question is what makes it special. It's a very good question. Uh, the missions you mentioned before were all designed to find planets. And the way they did this was to use transit photometry, technique we've talked about earlier. Yeah. And they stared at fixed points in the sky for days, months, even years, looking for the transit of these uh, of, uh, exoplanets. What Chaos is, is a follow-up mission. And what we will do is to follow up on known exoplanets. So or, uh, exoplanets that are orbiting bright stars. We know when and where to point, and that's key. Uh, we look at bright stars so that we can measure the mass from the ground. And by combining the mass with the size, and from the size we get the volume, we're able to say something about the density, make a first measurement of the bulk density of the and that's a first step in motorization. We also have the potential to identify targets which are particularly special to be followed up with future missions, planets which have thin atmospheres, perhaps like the Earth. Our last film on Kiops now, a look at the operations center in Spain. An antenna at the National Institute of Aerospace Technologies into on the outskirts of Madrid. This will be Chaos's oh, nice. primary connection to the Earth, a vital link between the space telescope and mission scientists. Over the past year, the international team at the Chaos Mission Operations Center has been preparing for launch, training for in-flight activities, including commissioning, commanding, and monitoring the satellite, as well as testing communication systems to ensure a smooth flow of scientific data. We actually don't train ourselves only for the standard or expected situations, but also for unexpected situations and real problems that may happen so uh, the reason that's the reason why we have to to shift and we try to create problems for the other ship so that they don't know what's going to happen in the simulations and then we fake that something wrong is happening and they have to find out and of course sort it out in the critical phase shortly after launch when chaos is safely in orbit 700 kilometers above the earth the mission operations team will ensure the satellite is in good health before switching on its telescope. During this time, it is, impor it is important to have more visibility of what is happening in the satellite. So ISA will provide more ground stations. So instead of just four or six passes, six times you see the spacecraft during the, during the day, you will have a one contact with the, road, with the satellite each 100 minutes. So it's more um, easy to see that everything is okay and to solve any problem. That's why uh, during this phase, we will uh, send commands not only from the routine ground station, but also from ground station from the Antarctica, uh, from um, the close to the North Pole. Everyone at the Mission Operations Center is planning for a smooth mission, but the team will be well prepared for any surprises. <laughs> Yeah, thinking of surprises, you've been project scientist for six years. I imagine in that time you've been faced with some challenges. Are there any that stand out? A very interesting challenge that we have is on the ground segment, which you heard it's about. Uh, this is used to control, operate, talk to the satellite, and uh, collect the data. It's sort of everything that's on the ground apart from, so apart from the satellite. The complexity was that there were six different teams working on the ground segment. The science operations team in Geneva that you heard about the instrument team, the mission operations center, the uh, Airbus uh, satellite providers, and also ESA. Uh, so how many people? That was six, six different, six different uh, teams. Six teams, huh? Oh, more Lots. than 30 people. And the final details for each of the different That's elements. That's Bernard, I forgot. Projects. People needed them at different times, but the information was coming uh, it's almost bit, uh, out of sync. It's not always convenient happening. for everybody, nor easy to work with, but we're we got there and we have a, an efficient <coughs> ground segment. Great. How does, uh, how would you say Kiops fits in with the overall ESA scientific program, which is very vast? 
Yeah, no, sorry, guys. I'm waiting for Kelps operation now. Um, Got to do other stuff. That's a discovery mission. It's a discovery oh, okay. and a characterization uh, uh, mission. And what it'll look for in particular is planets that are, have a surface temperature with, which is that sufficient to find water that's in a liquid form at, its, at the surfaces. There'll then be Ariel, which is foreseen to launch in 2028, and that will do dedicated survey of the atmosphere. There we go, fourth initial to forget. Planets, looking for the molecules in the atmospheres. Okay, let me just interrupt you briefly. As you can see on the screen, we've had our fourth frigate ignition. We're right on target at 710 kilometers. This is a short burn of less than one minute. The frigate is positioning Kops, your satellite, okay, for separation in about three minutes. In just about a second or two, you will see the engine shut down. So we've had our fourth burn. The DDO should uh, confirm that. So we are approaching the big moment. So you're probably full of suspense, so I'll keep you talking so you won't be thinking about the suspense. The satellite's lifetime, three and a half years. That's not long. What are you going to do in three and a half years? Well, it may not sound like a lot of time, but we're going to do a lot in that, uh, in those three and a half years. We, we hope to observe about 500, of order 500 uh, exoplanets. Some will be very well known. Some are placeholders for future discoveries, inc including targets which will come from tests or other surveys from the cloud. Pla placeholders meaning? Placeholders meaning that we have some time reserved to, to insert those new planets into the schedule. So we'll be following up on some that you may have already heard of. For example, 55 Cancri E, which is a very hot, small planet. It's hot because it uh, has an orbit which is very close to its host star. We don't know what it's made of yet, but is it rocky, lava even? And also then HD 97658B. Why, why do they have these names? Can't they be called Mary? Or they, come from, <laughs> they come from catalogs, and it's a catalog number, similar to a telephone number, one could say, a way of identifying the, the stars. This target is a, a small mini Neptune-like uh, planet, so it's a scaled-down uh, icy planet. And that's a follow-up. We're a follow-up mission. We'll study the clouds in atmospheres with very close in uh, puffy Jupiters, possibly find new planets, even exomoons or rings like those around uh, Saturn, although that will be tough. So, uh, let's see. All right, we have uh, about a minute before separation. Uh, let's talk about the data that you're saying that we'll get from the satellite that will all be made public, I imagine? Eventually, in the first instance, it will go to the, the people who proposed the people who proposed to do, make the observations, so the consortium uh, in, sure. in most cases, but then also scientists from the community who proposed the, to do that, the After about a year, a year and a half, the data will then be public and it will be available through an archive at Geneva. Available to, to anyone? Imagine I'm a scientist, I'm outside the consortium. Can I get access to the data? Anyone can um, anyone. access the data, indeed. It's free for, it's free for everyone. Just about a minute before separation. Maybe I can say something about the guest observers program. We have a program which enables scientists uh, from outside the consortium to use uh, KOPS to do their exciting to, uh, science. They can choose to observe whatever they wash, uh, wish to do. It's up to them, providing it's somewhat different in, in choice of target from those uh, chosen by the, by the science team. So it's a very nice opportunity for people to make use of the exciting capabilities of chaos. All right, any researchers out there want to use the data, contact Kate Isaac at the European Space Agency. Meanwhile, we have 20 seconds before separation of your satellite. What's going through your mind right now? Oh, uh, quite a lot, actually. It's uh, interesting thoughts, uh, how, how we've gone from ideas to paper to metal to, to launch in a, in a period of, well, more than, more than six years. There we go, chaos separation. Started on thought of what's to come. Very exciting. It is very exciting. We have the scheduled separation of Kiops. You saw it on the animation, but we're of course waiting for confirmation by the DDO. Again, remember the information, a slight delay, because it has to come halfway around the world. The separation of Kiops. Good. So I'm in the video here because I'm not sticking around for another however many I don't say stressful. hour and a half or whatever. I'm back in 25. Goodbye.